Okay, well, let's get started. Um, I'm Larry Michelle. I'm the president of the Economic Policy Institute and the uh, director of the Education and Policy Research Program at EPI. Um, so welcome. Uh, you're in for uh, a real treat. Um, we have some uh, a great panel, some real expertise, and some uh, really solid analysis that uh, breaks new ground, both uh, comparing uh, education outcomes across countries and with states, both uh, cross-sectionally and over time. Can't get much better than that. Um, and this is basically, you know, the stuff of what we are confronted with all the time in the in the press. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of insights in this about uh, what to believe, what not to believe, and what we ought to focus on. Um, it's my job just to lay out the logistics. We're going to have our moderator, Mary Beth uh, Markline, uh, run the show. Uh, the speakers will speak, and then uh, Mary Beth will ask uh, some questions, there'll be some answers and discussion, and that will be opened up for uh, questions and answers, uh, questions from the audience, answers from the panel. Um, the logistics are, um, if you want to look for the bathrooms, they're back that way. There's a back door. Go that way so you don't walk through the, uh, the videoing. This is on, uh, videoing online. Hello, online audience. This will be available um, as a video uh, soon after the program, probably sometime today, with our uh, crack crew from, uh, from EPI. Um, and with that, let me just introduce Mary Beth, uh, who was for, for many years a reporter uh, at USA Today covering higher education, uh, now reports for University World News, uh, writing about international education. Uh, she has the great um, benefit of having returned uh, to go to grad school, which is a very admirable and tough thing to do at George Mason University. And we're very pleased to have uh, Mary Beth here to moderate the program. Thank you very much. Ah. Well, so welcome, everybody. It's great to see you all. Uh, I think the timing of this report is really interesting, given that the NAEP scores just came out, and I'm sure our panelists will want to make a little bit of, um, give us a few of their insights about what to make of the scores. But uh, beyond that, I'm going to just kind of do quick introductions and then let, uh, let, it, let the presenters begin. So Martin Carnoy is the Vita Jacks Professor of Education and Economics at Stanford University, uh, and he's a research associate here at the Economic Policy Institute. Um, he is teaching comparative education this fall at, at uh, Stanford, and um, let's see, oh, he holds an electrical engineering degree from Caltech and a PhD in economics from University of Chicago. Emma Garcia is an education economist here at the Economic Policy Institute, specializing in the economics of education and education policy. After they give their presentations, uh, Jim Harvey is going to offer some feedback and comments. He is the director of National Superintendents Roundtable, um, an association of 80 school superintendents from 30 states. He also uh, just received his PhD, he informed me, and his dissertation uh, eventually turned into what is the, called the iceberg effect. So in January 2015, he uh, was the lead author of School Performance in Context, the Iceberg Effect, which explored cool school performance in the United States and eight comparable nations. Unfortunately, Bill Schmidt could not make it today, or he had flight troubles, um, so he's not going to be able to make it in time to our panel. So I am hoping that the audience will sort of crowdsource his questions and come up with all kinds of good things to say, good things to ask. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Martin, and thank you all for being here. Yeah. Oops, did I do that backwards? <laughs> I will turn this over to Emma. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, we are dividing the presentation um, into two pieces. I'll cover uh, the first is, and I'll turn it to 
Martin in a, in a few minutes. Uh, before we get started, um, it's very important for the three co-authors of this paper to thank the very many people who helped us uh, finalizing and writing this report. And I should start by uh, the Within uh, Education team uh, here at EPI, Larry Michel and Elaine Weiss, who is sitting uh, in the back. Uh, um, they helped uh, in the final stages of this paper and uh, also in the very initial ones, uh, requesting the report uh, in a way. Um, second of all, we received very helpful comments from three external reviewers, Professors Henry Levin, Sunny Ladd, and David Berliner, and their guidance was very, very helpful for shaping the contents and, and the message uh, of our study. Um, and uh, I'll also like to thank uh, Mike McCarthy, who has been working with us for a few weeks uh, editing the report, um, the research assistants helping with the data, and the communication teams, uh, team within EPI helping in putting together the event, disseminating, and many, many other things. Um, Finally, to Mary Beth for joining us uh, today as the moderator, and to Jim Harvey. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation with you, the discussion, and also with the audience. So since we want to keep much, uh, uh, the most of our time for the conversation and the discussion, let me just go straight to the main points that this uh, paper does. Uh, we make uh, three main points uh, in this study. The first one um, is the following. Although international tests, such as the PISA and TIMS, show that US students perform below students in other countries, uh, this, cannot, this does not mean that US students are not making greater academic progress than students in many of the high-scoring countries. These country averages, in a way, hide uh, the great variation in performance that exists within each specific country variation across uh, student subgroups, variation across regions, etc. So we need to be uh, uh, very um, aware of what the country average means. The second point that we make has to do with the fact that lessons or education reforms that come from looking into what other countries are doing are not often valid or applicable to US education. Uh, we'll provide a few examples in a few minutes, uh, but the, the main idea is that it's very challenging to craft education policy based on international comparisons. The third, uh, the third point is that because there is not such thing as a US educational system, we should be looking at performance of students in 51 different state systems or educational systems that deliver fund, uh, regulate education within the country. Um, moreover, since students in some of these states are performing as high as students in the highest scoring countries, we would do better if we took lessons for, for how to improve education policy if we looked at what these states are doing. So just a, a few um, data results and comments on each of the points. I'll cover the first two and I'll turn it over to Martin to focus on, on the um, bi-state analysis. There's uh, indeed important, important signs of increasing and high performance within the US. Uh, if we look at variation depending on the socioeconomic background of students or the family academic resources, FARC, uh, as we do in these studies, uh, in our study, we can see that this advantage SES US students looking into the US as a whole have made larger gains over time in both PISA and teams, and those gains have been larger than gains done by the same low SES growth in other countries, especially in the higher scoring countries. Low SES students in some states, bringing in the variation across regions, have made very large gains in math, which is traditionally the weak subject for uh, US students. <coughs> and those gains have been also, uh, have been uh, larger than in other countries as well. In some specific states, high SES students, example, Connecticut, Minnesota, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Indiana, and Colorado, perform at least as well in math, again, as students in Quebec, England, or Finland. There's more evidence of high and improving performance. I'm just bringing in more dimensions of variation here. 
students in Massachusetts and Connecticut, if we use the data from PISA 2012, in reading, perform roughly the same as in Canada, Finland, Korea, Poland, or Ireland. And they score higher than in France, Germany, or the UK. This will be looking at the average performance of students um, in each of these states. Over time, which is one of the most important dimensions in our study, uh, if we look at the period 1999-2011, using data from TIMSS, mathematics, students in Massachusetts, Minnesota, and North Carolina made gains at least as large as in Finland, Korean, Korea, or the UK. Why it's important uh, or challenging or difficult to uh, learn from what other countries are doing and apply that to education policy within the US? Um, what we want to say here is that educational reforms suggested from high-scoring countries are not based on compelling enough evidence on why some countries score higher or have improved over time. So that's the main obstacle and limitation. Uh, in addition, the social and educational contexts uh, in which education uh, outcomes are produced in the different countries are very different across uh, uh, states, across countries. Um, looking into uh, some examples that tend to be used as examples, role models of education, for example, Finland uh, offers its students five years of preschool. It has a low poverty rate and it has a much uh, higher equity across uh, students than the US. And Korea um, families invest a lot of time and resources into cram and private tutoring. Another reason why it's hard to um, import the reforms from these um, uh, countries is that some of those reforms are just not relevant to the United States, States uh, characteristics. For example, Germany and Poland uh, track a viability students starting in high school, and some other countries do it even earlier. Uh, this is a very uh, complex topic, and there has been a lot of conversation and a lot of um, misutilization of international tests, in a way. And um, a review of the critiques, uh, we wanted to announce that um, Martin Carnoy has just uh, uh, published with NEPC, the National Education Policy Center, a paper that reviews many of these uh, critiques, and this paper has been uh, released as of today. Um, this is the end of my uh, presentation, and I'll turn it over to Martin to um, uh, see what potential solution, additional analysis we can do to learn more about education policy in the country. Uh, thanks, Emma, and thanks to uh, all the people at EPI for helping us get this out so quickly. Um, so to summarize so far, um, the main argument that we're putting forth that Emma laid out is that we do have um, a uh, more, much more progress. Uh, in U.S. education uh, than is usually focused on. And I just want to make the point that uh, we'll t discuss later uh, that we've had a decline in, in uh, scores uh, announced on Wednesday in the NAEP. Uh, but if you caught the beginning of the headline, what the shock was, was this was the first time in 25 years that there was a decline in math scores. And as far as I can tell, everybody who's been telling us about how terribly we're doing on the international tests has failed to tell us that we've made this tremendous increases in math score in the United States on our national tests. So um, the second point that we want to do is that it's much more useful, since we have such high variation in the United States, to shift the discussion to variation within our own country and to understand what we can learn, the main, the main point of our paper is how do we learn from what has happened over a long period of time in the United States uh, in, among the different states? What can we learn from those states that are, have done well over time, particularly well, and 
uh, these happen to be states that compare very well with other countries. So what can we learn from these comparisons with U.S. states? Well, we have data over a long period of time uh, for our um, fourth and eighth grade mathematics and fourth and eighth grade reading. Um, and what we did, uh, this is a very, it's, it's very difficult to do this, but uh, uh, we took uh, state-adjusted scores for, uh, the NAEP has been taken by all states since 2003. It's mandated under, uh, I believe, No Child Left Behind that they have to take uh, the NAEP. But before then, a, a, a large number of states also took the NAEP all the way back to 1990. Um, so what we did was we did, uh, we adjusted the scores using the individual data, the individual data set, the micro data. We adjusted these scores. Emma worked on this for a year, adjusted all these scores, and uh, corrected uh, so-called corrected, adjusted the scores for a lot of variables uh, uh, of individual uh, differences among the uh, family backgrounds of the kids, whether they were in uh, ELL courses, whether they were in special ed courses. Um, and we also adjusted for the co school composition. So on the idea that schools that concentrate kids who are very poor, concentrate kids who are better off, that those schools uh, they have peer effects. So we corrected for that. We also did an adjustment for some of the teacher variables that are available in, in the NAEP. So um, we took these adjusted scores uh, from, for eighth grade math from 92 to 2013, and we did um, fourth grade math and reading uh, for, uh, and eighth grade reading from 2003 to 2013. And then we asked the question, why do some states do better than others? And we tried to find out if these, what we had left, the scores that we had left once we adjusted uh, for these uh, different variables that uh, probably do not have to do so much with the quality of schooling once we try to take that out, do these differences that are left, are they related to other things? Um, and to keep things simple, uh, we're just going to focus on eighth grade math in this presentation. So um, much of the variation, as you might guess, in the, all the scores, math and reading, uh, are due to socioeconomic differences among the students and socioeconomic composition of the schools. Um, uh, once we took all that out and we looked at eighth grade math, we found out that from 92 to 2013, uh, the states that were in the top 10 gaining states, they made gains on the NAEP that were twice as large as the bottom 10 states, 1.6 points a year versus 8.0.8 points a year. If you take that over 20 years, it's a huge difference. It's a difference of uh, one standard is one standard deviation. What I said. It's a one standard deviation of the NAEP score uh, over the, the uh, I'm sorry, half a standard deviation over the 20 years. That's huge half a standard deviation. You'll never find an intervention that will produce that large a change in, uh, among uh, the entire literature on this. So the next thing we did was uh, to compare states, neighboring states, that had big differences between them that looked very similar to each other on all other grounds. So here's Massachusetts and Connecticut. Can you see it? Massachusetts and Connecticut. And you can see that after 2003, Massachusetts, first of all, their, their paths are pretty similar before 2003. And after 2003, all of a sudden, Massachusetts starts to make big gains. Now, they both go down. I, I just extended it uh, to 2015, uh, making a kind of correcting, uh, f uh, using the same corrector as in 2013. But the, the dashed line represents the observed score, and the solid lines represent the adjusted scores for 
uh, kids, the differences among the kids in the two states. Now, it's all corrected to the U.S. average. So you can see that both Massachusetts and Connecticut are below the observed scores because these are high socioeconomic states. These are states that are pretty rich states. So correcting them to the U.S. mean on who the kids are knocks them both down. But that, that's less important than seeing these trajectories. And you can see that the gain between in 10 years is a half a standard deviation. Massachusetts exceeds Connecticut by half a standard deviation. Now, these are just neighboring states. Now, we can learn far more from this comparison than worrying about why Connecticut didn't do as well as Finland. Makes much more sense to just look at a neighboring state and look at what their policies are. Now, here are uh, California and Texas, okay? And what's interesting about this is that, uh, I'm sorry, this is not California and Texas. So. It's not California and Texas. This is, what? Some of it's the wrong, it's, it's the wrong graph. No, it's not California and Texas. Yeah, yeah, what? Not on the bottom. It's it's on the, right. The title was different. It's, yeah, it's the wrong graph, yeah. It's okay. Uh, I, do we have California and Texas way down? Me, yeah. Oh, I can show you some other states. Yeah. Is this what Are you interested in this at all? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here's the... People love these kind of comparisons. That's why we did them. So, <laughs> and they actually have, have policy sense. That's what's really nice about them. First of all, it's over a long period of time. It's 20 years. So uh, here is Minnesota and Iowa, neighboring states, okay? And you can see I didn't extend this one, but Iowa goes down a little bit. Minnesota goes down more. But the fact is that, again, starting in about 2000, Minnesota starts to make bigger gains. Now, the difference between these two states is not as great as between, um, Minnesota, uh, between Massachusetts and Connecticut, but we know that Minnesota did, had different education policies in Iowa. I was sort of a laissez-faire state. You know, they didn't want to ever test kids at all. Uh, they gave the Iowa basic skills test, eighth grade, that's it. And then finally they had to test because of... Uh, no child left behind, but basically they've been a laissez-faire state. Uh, very similar states. Here's uh, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And what's interesting about this, by the way, is in 2015, Tennessee d does continue to go up a little bit, and North Carolina drops a lot, and Kentucky drops a little bit. So now Tennessee is actually higher than Kentucky. So. Why, first of all, why did North Carolina go up so much in the 1990s? Well, my answer is Lamar Hunt. I mean, it's pretty clear he put in a lot of... So what did Lamar Hunt do? Well, no, people have studied that, but they haven't studied in a systematic way to see if those policies actually were then adopted by these other states. Kentucky has been a very much of a reform state, and they have made gains, but you can see that uh, Kentucky's scores did go up and have been going up as much as North Carolina in the later period, but somehow there's still a big difference. North Carolina scores among the highest states in the United States. It's not a rich state. I mean, it's not a, it's a very diverse state. So here's uh, New York and New Jersey. We have the same thing. Governor Christie should love this graph, although <laughs> probably has very little to do with him because these things started back, uh, uh, much further back. So anyway, the main point of all this is to say these kind of comparisons are much more interesting than the, the ones that are usually made internationally. And they have much more sense, because you can actually look at these states and look at all our states and see these are more or less going to the same kind of school system, face the same kind of labor markets for teachers. Uh, the training programs for teachers are very similar. So what have they done? What have these states done? And we just want to sh shift attention in that direction. So uh, one of the interesting things that uh, I want to uh, add 
at the end here, is to say that even these residuals, even these state differences, uh, correcting for all these variables, that when we try to figure out at a first cut, what might explain us? What is this correlated with across states? And one of the things that's interesting is that it is there, these differences that are left once you correct for all these other variables, they still, the poverty of the state, the child poverty in the state, is still correlated with what's left. So actually poverty seems to hit uh, how well kids do at three levels. One, at their individual level. Poorer kids at the individual level don't do as well in school on these tests as kids that are from better off families. Secondly, if you go to a school which is high concentration of, of um, kids in poverty, if you go to that kind of school, also a big effect versus a school that has few kids in poverty. And now, if you live in a state which has a high level of child poverty, both the high-income kids and the low-income kids are going to do worse than in a state in which there's low levels of poverty, just living in that kind of state. So three levels, the poverty affects how well schools do, like how well kids do in school. And accountability, the strength of the accountability, is also correlated with how well the kids do. I'm sorry to say that. I'm not a great fan of accountability. But the fact is <laughs> that it is, it is positively correlated and significantly correlated. So states with you know, this strong accountability, like the Texas, North Carolina, states like that, they uh, did better on average. OK? Things that were not correlated, things were not correlated, were um, teachers' union, the, the um, I guess it's the strength of the teachers' unions measured by an EPI index of strength, isn't it? Uh, it's, is it? No, it's the proportion of uh, teachers oh, union and their of, CBA. Yeah, of, of members. Covered by, mm -hmm. collective bargaining. Covered by collective bargaining, okay. There's quite a variation in the United States on this. Uh, so that's not significant. Uh, neither is, unfortunately, spending per uh, student. Uh, and the third one was, uh, oh, the percentage of adults uh, with higher education in the state. Okay, so poverty, yes, not high education of the parents. Okay, I've talked too long already, but... Um, so we haven't been able to explain why Massachusetts did better than Connecticut, or everybody will have ideas here why this is true, but we, I just want to tell you, everybody has ideas about all this, but nobody's done a systematic analysis to do these comparisons. That's the point. It's going to have to be qualitative, but it's going to have to be convincing and not just off the top of the head, just like with these 2015 scores, I saw at least 10 different reasons why these 2015 scores went down. But it's not systematic. Um, and uh, just to tell you, I think we truly believe that the purpose of our paper was to get people to focus on this and to unravel this puzzle, because this is going to be much more interesting. The answer to this to these questions is much more interesting. I mean, it's less romantic uh, to fly to Massachusetts or to Texas than to fly to Finland or to Singapore. But the answers are going to be much more obvious flying to Massachusetts and Texas than going off to there. OK? I think that's uh, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin and Emma and Mary Beth. And I want to start by uh, thanking 
uh, Larry, Michelle, and EPI for the opportunity to participate in this panel. I really think this is a very significant piece of scholarship, and it adds considerably to the discussion about what's going on uh, in American education. So I want to congratulate Martin and Emma, and also uh, Tatiana Kavinson, uh, who apparently is in Moscow, and I hope she's able to view this as, as we stream it. So I want to make five points very briefly. Um, and the first is to acknowledge that we have very real problems in our schools. I, I, none of us can pretend that we don't. Uh, I will contend that we've done a reasonably good job with the, with the students in our schools that the schools were originally designed to educate. But now we face a very new challenge, and I think it's an unprecedented challenge in the world. For the first time in the history of the United States, the majority of students in American public schools are both low income and children of color. And I don't know anyone else that's contending with that. And this is a very real problem that we need to get on with. And it's not helped, frankly, by hyperventilating about highly questionable international assessments. You know, w we need to get into the meat of the challenges that face us, uh, not the challenges that draw people's attention on the front page of the newspapers. Uh, the second thing we need to understand is a point that Martin and Emma, I think, made very clearly. The American educational system is not one system at all. It's 51 different systems of education made up of 50 different states and the District of Columbia. And if you add in the possessions, uh, we, can, we can start to get it very quickly up to 55 or 56. Now, people who understand American schools and are involved with them on a daily basis take this for granted. We think it's so obvious that we don't even need to state it. But unfortunately, those who, who are more sort of concerned with national systems don't understand the dynamics of how this system works and therefore the more sensible ways to develop policy solutions to, to address these challenges. And, and I might say that it's not only 51 different systems, uh, we also have some 13,000 different local school districts uh, implementing uh, the decisions of these 51 different systems. So the implementation challenges are also huge. Uh, in that light, I think there's an argument to be made that we should follow Canada's approach specifically with respect to the TIMS assessments, the Trends in International Math and Science Survey. Uh, Canada doesn't report national results in, under TIMS. Instead, we get provinces reporting their work. And as I understand it from this report of uh, Martins and Emmas, at least some seven states have taken, have participated in state level assessments in either PISA or TIMS over the years. So there's some precedent, I think, for that in the United States. And I would like to encourage the U.S. Department of Education and any of their officials who are here today, along with any state officials, to take some of the millions and billions of dollars that they've been spending on assessment and direct them towards encouraging state-level participation in these international assessments and reporting on a state-level basis. I think that would be extremely useful. Third, I'm very impressed with the manner in which bringing it back home focuses on a particular set of nations. And Mary Beth mentioned that I, that I developed a report called School Performance in Context, the Iceberg Effect. And it focused on eight nations and the United States that altogether account for more than 50% of global domestic product. Um, so naturally, you won't be surprised to learn that when Martin and Emma's assess report focuses on eight states plus the United States that are either high-scoring or post-industrial nations. Since it so closely tracks sort of the thinking that was in my report, I want to applaud them for being so smart. <laughs> So, and I think there's very good reason to focus on a more limited s set of nations if you're going to be in the international comparison business. What can we possibly hope to learn from a small principality like Liechtenstein uh, with 5,600 students when we're worried about our 56 million students? What do we hope to learn from dictatorships like Kazakhstan and Shanghai, uh, which have five-year plans for their educational systems, when we have trouble actually uh, getting people in the United States to agree on a common core of what we want people to learn? And why would we think that we're going to learn very much from a religious monarchy where the monarch appoints the parliament and, the, and he appoints uh, all of the ministers in his or her government. I guess it's, they're all he, he's for the most part, I think. Uh, so why are we worried about what's going on in Qatar and other, other, other religious monarchies? I think high achieving and post-industrial nations are the appropriate level of comparison for the United States. 
This paper's construction of a family academic resources index, this FAR index that Martin was talking about, creates a proxy for poverty and disadvantagement, uh, just as, and just as the iceberg effect argued that you have to take students' life circumstances into account, I think this FAR adjustment is a very valuable introduction uh, to the conversation. Uh, and I want to emphasize what Martin said towards the end of his, uh, his, his findings about this tri-level effect of poverty. This is the first time I've seen this. I think this is a significant new finding. Um, to quote from the report, the effect of poverty on education performance is a three-level effect. In addition to the well-documented impact of individual and school-level poverty, state-level poverty puts students in all socioeconomic levels at additional educational disadvantage. And I think this is, is very significant. I saw a report come out recently from Rutgers University that sort of cross-indexed uh, ethnicity and race against this, this issue of child poverty. And it turns out that African American students or students of color generally in the United States are ten times as likely as white students to be living in communities of concentrated poverty. And surely we as a nation need to be paying attention to that as we think about our educational challenges. And finally, uh, I love the pairing of the states that Martin just, just ran through, and I hope state policymakers will pay a lot of attention to it. And, you know, in some ways this data about the states is sort of like uh, data to back up the gossip that we all have about the states, but it, 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 it's real data. Uh, the paper presents a very complicated analysis overall. It's different tests, different international tests, different subjects, uh, different years, different nations in different assessments, frequently cross-cut by the socioeconomic measure that Martin and Emma have introduced into the thing. So this is not light reading that you're going to take to the beach with you. <laughs> <laughs> but it is very reassuring to know that some states, American states, are competitive with the highest achieving nations in some subjects and grades, especially when socioeconomic status is taken into account. But, and so there's, you know, this complex analysis is accompanied by this, the brilliant simplicity, really, uh, of the final portion of the paper uh, that pairs neighboring states with each other. And uh, Martin just went through them. So we find Massachusetts paired with Connecticut, New York with New Jersey, California with Texas, Minnesota with Iowa, and North Carolina with Kentucky and Tennessee. So there's a really rich diversity of states looked at in this analysis, and I, I would hope that state policymakers would look at that, because I think it's in comparisons such as this that we're going to find out why states, whether they started out low or high scoring on NAEP, uh, made significant gains at both the low end of the scale and the upper end of the scale. And in contrast to the political uses to what NAEP has put, I want to say that the NAEP database is one of the most significant national assets, particularly at the state level, that we have in this country for, uh, for uh, understanding what's going on in our schools. Um, we also find that strong accountability works. Uh, Martin just went through that. The child poverty is a huge issue, and now we know it's a three-part issue, and that union strength seems to be uh, irrelevant in terms of, of outcomes, and we can't really, well, we might all like to bash unions, and particularly sometimes superintendents go to war with their unions. We can't blame unions for the situation that we find. So let me conclude by quoting directly from bringing it back home. Quote, the lessons embedded in how these states increase student achievement in the past two decades are much more relevant to improving student outcomes in other U.S. states than looking to high-scoring countries with social, political, and educational histories that differ markedly from the U.S. experience. And I think that uh, says it very well, and it sums up the report in a nutshell. Thank you. Now, am I on? Is my you can hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. This is really, really interesting, and I do have a few questions that I want to um, ask right away, uh, and then we'll open up to everybody and their solutions and their their contributions. I can tell you that if I was still working at USA Today and I brought this report to my editors and told them what it said, what they would want me to write about is 
that some states are showing great improvement over the, this, this idea of the improvement that's happening. And it's such a good newsy story that I almost wonder why hasn't anybody done this before? I mean, it sort of seems like we should have been looking at this a long time ago. So I'm intrigued by that, um, especially because of the, as you say, the brilliant simplicity. So that's one question is, how is it that we're just starting to disaggregate this data at this stage? My second question is, um, as somebody who's studying how the United States interacts with the rest of the world, I wonder about the message we might, this might be sending on some level that, that we have nothing to learn from other countries. And I, ha and I, and I would hesitate to, I would like to have you sort of clarify that a little bit. Okay? So whoever wants to respond. <laughs> I'll say uh, something about, I think it's growing the number of uh, analysis that start disaggregating the data. Uh, as Jim mentioned, yes, uh, we produced a, a sophisticated uh, analysis, which was not uh, so complicated to do uh, when you have the support, and I uh, forgot to mention this at the beginning, from people like Emmanuel Sicali, who is here from the uh, NCES, who was willing to help and answer any questions that made the analysis less complicated to us. So uh, thank you, Emmanuel. I, I didn't mention at the beginning. Uh, so I think it's, it's because there's a growing demand in uh, ex or a growing awareness of how these disaggregated data uh, can inform us, can help us. We are shaping our questions in a new direction, and therefore we are shaping our analysis in a new uh, direction. Um, this is, for me, it's one of the, 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 the lessons. Um, uh, as we paired countries for learning, I think we also need to do a better job pairing uh, our questions with the data that we have. And the U.S. is um, perhaps a privileged uh, place uh, to do analysis on because it has all this uh, information. And um, before perhaps Martin adds to what I am saying, uh, uh, I don't think this report should be interpreted as saying international comparisons are not valid. They are valid for specific purposes. They, are, they, haven't, not, they haven't been uh, well used for um, the goals that we are discussing here. So uh, it's, they, they have a lot of interest. Uh, we do international comparisons all the time. It's more about the utilization of the uh, comparisons. I think you had two questions there. One is why is the good news story not a usual story? And my, my theory is that we are edumasochists. <laughs> and we, uh, that, not we, but there is a significant group of people who apparently gain some political advantage by bashing the U.S. educational system. Um, the um, the question of why nobody has done it before is that sometimes the obvious is the most interesting. And in fact, uh, there are many countries like the United States. Uh, Jim uh, mentioned Canada. Canada on the Thames, as he mentioned, only reports uh, provincial data, does not, pro does not pro uh, report a Canada uh, data. Now, on the PISA, they report Canada. But you can, get the prov you can get provincial data on the PISA also if you have a friend in Canada who will give it to you. Uh, I'm serious. Uh, it isn't just published like that. It isn't on the regular uh, available data. Uh, the NAEP data have been available at the individual level, and people have used it for various stuff, but they have used it usually just one year. They've done analysis of one year. It's, it's a lot of work, Emma can attest to this. Uh, it's a lot of work, particularly if you want to go uh, before 2003, where it's not one data set. It is a data set for each state, and you've got to combine it. You've got to mesh all those states. Uh, so. It's, it's not easy if you want to, if, if you want to go before 2003. It's a, it's a lot of work. 
The, uh, th that's why we didn't do it for fourth grade reading and eighth grade reading and fourth grade math, because so we only went back to 2003. So it is a lot of work to do that. Um, so maybe it's a question of academic laziness. But I think rather it's because sometimes the most obvious thing, that there are big differences within a country. We're doing the same thing for Brazil, which is 27 states. Um, uh, that, uh, uh, we can get national test data for Brazil from 1999 all the way to 2013. Uh, and uh, we've done that. Uh, and there's huge variation in Brazil. The Germans will not release their uh, uh, Landa data, their, their uh, state data. They don't release it because they're worried about the north-south difference. Uh, the northern states do much worse than the southern states. And so the states are very, I uh, just had this explained to me by a German colleague, the states are very proprietous about their data. We don't do that. We're a free access uh, data society. So it's just a question of how hard you want to work. Uh, I think when, when once we realize what we were seeing, we said, my goodness, you know, this is so obvious. We should be looking at this stuff and, and looking in versus looking out. And there is a lot of good news here, a lot of good news. Uh, until this year, the, the test scores have gone up regularly. And by the way, even in 2015, a number of states made positive gains. And not only that, but the uh, fourth grade reading in general didn't go up significantly, but didn't go down. Um, um, more of this will yield uh, a lot of policy insights that we didn't have before. Um, if, <clears throat> if I could chime in on those two questions, too. I first became interested in international assessments in a real way around 1998, uh, when IEA, the people who produced TIMS, uh, first issued a, a fourth grade reading assessment called PEARLS, Progress in International Reading Literacy, which is still ongoing. And that first assessment showed that the United States in fourth grade reading was second out of 28 countries. Second out of 28 countries, Sweden was number one. That piece of good news was buried on page 17 of the Washington Post. But every time the TIMS data came out showing us somewhere in the middle of the pack, we got all of this uh, pearl clutching uh, about the future of the United States being at risk. So the bad news appears on the front page, and the good news, if it appears at all, uh, is buried in the back sections. Be because I think there is this well-funded echo chamber uh, of failure about American schools. And it feeds into perceptions that people have about, oh, yeah, I remember when I was in school, that was terrible. Um, why has nobody done this before? I think Martin did a good job of explaining it. This is very, very hard work, and you need some appreciation for the complexity of the work before you can even begin to do the analysis. And most, much of, I won't say most of, but much of uh, the research that we see being reported in the newspapers, much of it, uh, is advocacy masquerading as research. And I say that about some of the things I've produced myself. Um, by and large, nonprofits, small nonprofits, and universities uh, don't have the resources that they can pour into these kinds of complex analyses. And that's why I think we're seeing it here for the first time. I do have one more question uh, with my graduate student hat on. What would um, critics of this, or people who disagree with, uh, with your, the points you're making, what would the critics say about your methodology? Do you have any, any areas that you think they might poke holes in or try to poke holes in? Well, I, I presented this, uh, rough, roughly speaking, the results um, to, a, to a group in Australia about two months ago. And uh, a very well-known economist of education who's uh, among the edumasochists um, was there, uh, my colleague at Stanford, Eric Hanischek, and he thought it was a great analysis. So, uh, I mean, in terms just of methodologically, I mean, he had one point to make to do something a little bit different, but it didn't, it didn't make any difference. So I think the main critique will be this. It won't be of the methodology. It will be that uh, we are uh, looking for good news when the news is generally bad. Uh, and I think it's fair to say as Jim said, I want to reiterate, there is a lot to do in American education. Not every state is uh, Massachusetts, uh, I'm, I'm just talking about eighth grade math here, is Massachusetts or Texas or um, 
uh, North Carolina, uh, uh, Minnesota, there are these high-scoring states. Not every state is that kind of state. So there are a lot of states that are scoring quite low. I mean, there are lots of other high-scoring states, too. As I said, the top 10, uh, you'll be, these are corrected for differences in the, in the family academic resources of the kids in the schools. But uh, even so, the top 10 include, by the way, uh, uh, the gainers. The gain we focus a lot on gains. I think it's, it's also very important to focus on gains and not on level. Among the gainers, I, I don't think, I think Emma did point this out. Among the gainers are st uh, states uh, that started quite low and states that started quite high. Normally, when you look at gains, you think that most of the gains will be those who start low, because that's where the gains are to be made. But that's not the case. It's a mixture. So you have Louisiana, D.C., Hawaii, all states that started quite low, three of them. Then you have Vermont, uh, Massachusetts, high scorers that are up there, too. Uh, uh, so the point is that we should also be looking separately, perhaps, at why the what the differences were in policies of states that started low and had big gains versus states that started high. Did they use different policies? Did they have a different ways of approaching uh, educational improvement? So the main critique will be, you know, on average, the U.S. still does badly in mathematics. So that'll be the critique, you know. And the critique, and, and, and the biggest critique, by the way, which we point out, is that on average, the, the kids that do the worst relative to high-scoring countries are those who are advantaged in mathematics. Advantaged social class kids do, do worse in mathematics relative to other countries than our disadvantaged kids. Our disadvantaged kids, on average, have made much bigger gains than the advantaged kids uh, on these international tests and also score a lot lower relative to other countries. So um, I think there are critiques to be made. I mean, they're saying, you know, we're still, as a country, not doing great in education. But so that's not our point. Our point is that, first of all, we're making gains that have not been talked about, and even on international tests. And secondly, we have a, a lot of educational systems, real systems, not the US system, which is not a real system, real systems that are making tremendous progress. And so why aren't we looking at those systems instead of lamenting all the time how terrible the whole country is doing, uh, which is a point, but it's not helpful to figure out how to do better. The point is, how do you do better? How do you keep doing better? Where do you look? Where do you look for examples? Well, Finland's just not an example. Korea's just not an example. American kids are not going to spend six hours a day outside of school studying and doing cram schools. I just talked to a student of mine, a, a Korean-American, born in the United States. You know how she spent her summers every year? Going to cram schools from seventh grade through twelfth grade. Cram schools every summer. My grandkids go to soccer camp. Those kids go to cram schools. And what do they teach them in cram schools? I asked her, what did you, you learn in cram schools? Take tests. How to take tests. Basically, test after test after how do you How do you negotiate these tests? Oh, yeah, okay. If I send my kids every year to learn how to do tests, they're going to do better on tests. But it has nothing to do with the quality of education. It has to do with what... And these parents in Korea are spending $8,000 a year on each kid to send them to tutoring and cram schools. That's six... It's The, they, the average cost in Korea of schooling is $5,000 a year per kid. Now, at $13,000, they're spending more or less what Massachusetts spends on school. And I'll, I, it's... Emma, do you have anything to add? I, um, I'm not sure if this could be a critique or, or an so what question. Uh, but one of the things that I will report um, does not include is the why. Right, as Martin was saying, we, we, we propose how to do, we, we provide a systematic way of looking for those answers. But um, up to this point, uh, I'm just uh, getting ready for the whys from people, but there's no real <laughs> so uh, analysis of, of, of or answer to why is it. So I see that as both 
potentially a limitation of you did all of this, um, we, you are ready to uh, answer those questions, but we don't really know. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, that's a great way to segue into audience questions, and that, that hand up, run up first. I think there's a microphone, microphone going on. Um, I want to go back to the question that was asked by Mary Beth earlier. Why is it that nobody has done this type of analysis before? At the department, we have this rich data available, and we strongly encourage this type of analysis. We really want we really want researchers to go in the data and make hypotheses, slice and dice it the way that they think fits, and then do the research and publish. We strongly encourage this type of research. That's the point that I want to make. Emmanuel, can, can I, I'd like to add a sentence to what you said, uh, a question. When are we going to get the 2015 <laughs> individual level data? Well, I hope it won't be two years from now. Well, um, I can Good. I know. I know. I know. I, mine was an encouraging question. <laughs> oh, there was a question from the front here. Maryland. You, I guess, mathematician at um, grade school math, and I, I can provide a possible reason for the difference between Massachusetts versus Connecticut and Minnesota versus Iowa. Namely, Massachusetts and Minnesota, the math studies are written by Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bill Schmidt, who's not here, would totally agree with you. He also said exactly the same thing, that in Minnesota and Massachusetts, they made real effort to write real math standards, and uh, that this had an impact. Uh, he, he to, I, I can represent his view by uh, saying that he really believes that the main thing that explains most of this is opportunity to learn, which translated means a better curriculum. Uh, in mathematics that uh, allows the teachers to teach kids better math. The only thing I'd add to that is that it's easier to do that in states like Minnesota and Massachusetts than it is in, in, in high poverty states where teachers are, may not be quite as well prepared uh, as in Massachusetts and Minnesota to, 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 do, this hard, to do this higher standard curriculum. Now, the teachers are now better prepared in Massachusetts because my friend, anyway, uh, Sosky, put in a rule about five years ago that elementary school teachers actually have to pass an arithmetic test in order to be <laughs> certified. And that was, that was the first time that this was done uh, nationally. You were going to say something yes, quickly I'm, about Finland? Oh, Finland. Yes. Well, well both. Oh. So, well. Finland does not have a good math program. Flat out. The, the engineering professors, or the math professors, the engineering colleges in Finland are complaining loudly 
that students are showing up not knowing basic algebraic and arithmetic calculations. And so why is it that they appear first on PISA? Well, I, I read through PISA, and it's a very poor math test. And that's going to be polite. <laughs> All right. Anybody want to say anything about that? And then we've got another, some more questions from others. Yeah. I have a third, third point. Okay. I'm not so big into looking upon education as a boss case. But when I see the NAEP data say that only about a third or 40 percent of students are proficient or above over the past, I don't know how long, to me, there's a one, one word to describe that, and that's absurd. And that calls for major, big time improvement in the education system. And these small gains that they've measured over the past, whatever, 20 years, are, well, they're too small. I mean, we need some way to jump so that the number of proficient, you know, should be at least be two out of three. I, I do have a comment on that. Uh, the one word to describe the NAEP proficiency figures is the NAEP proficiency figures are nonsense. The NAEP, the NAEP proficiency definition was set politically, not by, not by analysts, and it was deliberately set uh, to make the schools look bad. Um, as early as the 1990s, people in NCES, when this proficiency benchmark was first set, stated very clearly that the NAEP proficiency benchmark was not grade level, that people who you and I would normally consider to be proficient by the common understanding of that term, could not meet the NAEP proficiency benchmark because it was an aspirational level. So they have twisted all meaning out of the term proficient and misled people in the public, including professors of education, about the true results. Um, so uh, my one word response is that, th that those results are nonsensical, and I say that having the greatest respect for the technical people uh, who administer NAEP and having the greatest respect for NAEP as, as, a, uh, a, as an assessment. But the proficiency benchmark was set by a group of politicians who sit on the National Assessment Governing Board. They are not assessment experts. They are not mathematicians. They are not economists. They are not researchers. And they were setting a political level, not, a, not, a, not an analytical level. I, I've, I've gone on at too great a length. Good morning, friends and colleagues. Uh, my name is Sarek Kaminsky with the American Federation of Teachers. And I just want to say thank you so much for this valuable research. And um, it's very interesting to see these links to poverty. Uh, on our website at go.aft.org forward slash equity, we've actually mapped trends in child poverty by county for every um, state and also the District of Columbia. Um, so you can take a look at that work there. Um, I also really appreciate your comments about unions uh, representing 1.6 members. Uh, we also find that high-performing countries have strong labor management collaborations, so appreciate your comments. Um, I do have a question. We've found that the U.S. is the second lowest rated OECD country in resource allocation, and I was wondering if the panel could please comment on your findings on resource allocation and disparities between districts and how stakeholders can do better in advocating for equitable funding and funding reform. Well, we, we didn't find a relationship between spending per student and um, these residuals. Um, however, let me comment about, about what's happened over the last, uh, since 2003, because I just looked at it this morning. The average spending per student in the United States has not risen since 2000, per, in three corrected for inflation. So one could argue, if you look at these data, uh, I don't know if you know this argument, maybe this is just sort of um, esoteric in-group in stuff, but there has been an argument among the, the edumasochists that uh, the uh, we have been spending a lot more on education and getting no gains. And they usually throw up the reading scores, to, to, the NAEP reading scores, to show that, to show the increasing uh, cost per student, 
but no gains. If you look at these data in math and reading over the last 10 years, you can see gains in both, and the math gains are very, very large. The reading gains are appreciable, but not large. So if you look at that and the fact that costs per student have not gone up over the past 10 years, you can make exactly the opposite argument now, that in fact we're getting much higher productivity with no increase in resources. Uh, and uh, for either reading or math. Uh, and so you can just turn that argument on its head and make it, uh, Larry will appreciate this, make it exactly analogous to the fact that productivity has gone up in the labor force, but wages have not gone up. So this is exactly analogous in the education sector. We know the teacher salaries in real terms aren't going up. Uh, uh, we know that costs per student are not going up, and yet productivity seems to be rising. Uh, and then the question is, on the 2015 data, it's already been mentioned by the, at the NCS uh, conference yesterday, the presentation of the data on Wednesday, that in fact one of the factors may be that when you do not spend more over a long period of time, uh, like ten, uh, 12 years, then you may in fact in f affect test scores, even though we don't find that relationship. Uh, I live in a state that clearly has been affected by the, the uh, very slow growth of spending over many years. Uh, our California test scores have, relative to the rest of the country, have not done very well. And it's a question of whether, oh, it may be not from year to year, or even from period to period, small periods, but if you do this for a long period of time, you probably do affect the quality of education. And uh, although uh, we don't find evidence of that, uh, not all statistical analysis uh, picks up all the inherent things that are happening. I actually have um, just a couple of And then you, you all mentioned a, a, a call for qualitative analysis. Can you talk a little bit more about what kind of analysis it is that you're looking at um, as someone else who will probably be going into the research uh, arena? I, I think it's also helpful to know what kind of future research you're hoping others will be doing. Are you Lily? Yeah. Yes. Hi. <laughs> We've had classes together. I didn't recognize you with your hair back. <laughs> OK, we're, we're going to divide the answer on this. So I'll do the accountability part. Uh, uh, back in um, uh, in the early in the in the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, the uh, Consortium for Policy Research and Education, which is now located at the University of Pennsylvania, a woman named uh, Margaret Gertz and her colleagues developed an account uh, called Every State and found out what they were doing. Uh, now this was pre. No Child Left Behind. Uh, and they, we, on, based on their data, uh, Susanna Loeb and I developed <clears throat> a five uh, a rubric of five items um, uh, and based on what states were doing, whether they were testing, how often they were testing, uh, all the way up to whether they had a, a, a high school exit exam that you had to pass in order to graduate. And based on that, you got a score of zero to five. So states like Nebraska and Iowa got zero, uh, and states like uh, Texas, I believe Maryland, a few other states got fives at that time. Um, so uh, those changed. With No Child Left Behind, more and more states did this kind of stuff. So in, in this paper, I must say, uh, and there have been papers written since, that have tried to measure accountability. And they, they will continue to do so, and they will get better, better measures of what would be called strength of accountability. So uh, based on that original index, 
uh, we adjusted it uh, over time to try to take account of the fact there was another one done in 2002, and then people did one later uh, to try to take care of No Child Left Behind. So we used in we used these I think three uh, three points in time of accountability. Uh, among the states to in our analysis, so just strength of accountability. So for the second question, um, what we propose, uh, we did it in, in the slide, um, and it's better justified in the paper, is a combination of qualitative and quantitative work, and that, uh, so I'm going to mention uh, elements that you would consider more qualitative or more quantitative. Um, in a way, we are uh, uh, advocating for a change in the way in which the questions uh, from policy to research and vice versa are framed. Um, and this uh, includes elements of sitting in, uh, around a table, uh, policy, research, uh, teachers, uh, and all uh, participants in the in the uh, education sector or the provision of education that uh, ask questions such as how is the curri curriculum uh, aligned with uh, what we want to do, um, implementation of common core, um, disparities in funding, equity within the state, um, preschool availability uh, for kids. A number of reasons that need to be argued, there needs to be a theory behind the reasons that are suggested and therefore uh, that work we consider more uh, qualitative work, the identification of the things that might be behind the trends and uh, the high performance of some uh, states versus other states uh, that should be tested uh, in the end with a quantitative analysis. So there can be a very long list uh, of, uh, like uh, Martin said, when we saw the um, result, the 2015 results, he said, there, I saw 10 uh, explanations. So we see a point and we find 10 potential explanations. We weigh, what we are arguing here is to think of the 10, 20, 15, uh, 100 explanations to test them uh, with, qualitative, uh, with quantitative analysis. So if I could add something on the accountability issue, I don't think any of us got into the field of education eager uh, to be accountability experts, but I think in this day and age, uh, you, you can't say that you don't favor accountability. Um, however, I can say that I don't favor simplistic accountability of testing kids and, and, and thinking that that's the be all and the end all. I think we need quite complicated accountability systems. Um, we have in state after state, state legislatures, thumbing their nose at court decisions uh, calling for equitable financing of schools. Um, earlier this month, our roundtable <clears throat> met here in Washington, D.C., and we actually heard from a school principal in Las Vegas uh, who leads Whitney Elementary School, an enrollment of 600 kids. Eighty-five percent of her enrollment is made up of children who are actually homeless. And by the time she graduates <coughs> these kids, she's not quite sure where they're going. Many of them wind up working on the streets of, of uh, Las Vegas. Um, doubtless serving uh, people who are calling for accountability. Um, the, the social circumstances and the poverty in which many children in the United States are, are, are being raised are just shameful if you look into them. And most of us drive by it on interstate highways and we never see it. And I would like some public officials to be accountable for properly serving these children, not only in school but out of school as well. Um, I know you asked a question, and there was a hand up right at the beginning that I, somebody who raised their hand right in the beginning, yes. not, okay, all right, so how many people have questions? Ah, because okay. do we want to just keep going with questions, or do you want to? Why don't you take all yeah. the questions, yeah. and then we'll. Ah, yeah. excellent, please. And, and so we can maybe do a couple more questions, and then uh, people who are not online can stay and have lunch and keep going. Okay. We should end our meeting. My question goes to your point that there's a correlation between state level poverty or the poverty of a state, the wealth of the state and the student scores. Child poverty, child poverty. Child poverty. And my question is whether the 
opposite is also true. And, and thinking of states or jurisdictions where there's a huge divide between the rich and the poor. I'm from DC, there's very wealthy people and there's some very poor people. And so did it translate for the poor children in comparatively wealthy states? Did it help them living in a wealthier state or were they still stuck where they're at? Hmm. We'll, we'll, add, we'll get some yeah. several questions uh, yeah. out right. so that we can well, sort of... <laughs> Better, yeah. uh, a, a viewer from North Carolina uh, asked me to uh, correct uh, Martin's reference to Hunt in North Carolina was not Lamar but Jim. Jim Hunt. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mixed up <laughs> Lamar Alexander and Jim Hunt. Yeah. Thank Lamar, you. Uh, Lamar Hunt's a sportsman. And, and, uh, it was, and Lamar uh, Hunt is an oil man. Um, Martin, I think, it's, um, I think it's wrong to characterize it as education masochists. Because that, that suggests it's a reflection of somebody's uh, personality. But this is actually uh, a very agenda-driven uh, result, as you know, that there are people who are uh, always looking at how our schools are failing because they have, a different, they have, a, they have their own policy agendas that they are That's a good point. So I think education masochists is, is, is important. Mm. So you would call them education sadists? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's not a matter of the corporate reformers that they are and the agendas that they have, and, the, and it's not a fair and balanced perspective. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple more questions over here. We'll just get them all out. And... Uh, in, your, in your computation of difference between the SARs, did you take into account race? Uh, because that is a false. One last question, then we'll go. Oh dear. Yes. <coughs> yes, private and charter schools. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, 
All right, so you have your questions. Anybody want to take a first crack? Yeah. I'll take um, uh, on the question whether we adjusted by uh, race ethnicity uh, with it, and we also did it uh, for the proportion of uh, students of different uh, races and ethnicities uh, in the school. Uh, I'm saying this, and I'll connect with the, uh, my answer to the to my answer to the last question, uh, which is the fact that. Uh, Race is only um, an important factor uh, as long as it correlates very strongly, minority status correlates very strongly with low SES, low social class. So uh, the, the important controls in our model uh, are individual and school level social class, socioeconomic status. Um, in that, and uh, going uh, to the last uh, question that was posed to us, we are obviously very uh, concerned about inequities, inequalities that we know uh, exist throughout the, the school life uh, of uh, an individual before uh, children get to school um, and they persist after they leave school. Um, what we believe, and the point that I was trying to make uh, during my presentation at the beginning of it is that if, you, if we just focus on a score, on an average score, both the success and the problems disappear in a way. They, they compensate one another, and, and we have one average uh, point that is not really informative. So from the disaggregation, from the knowing which uh, individual school and state variables are important for student performance, we um, want to make the case that we can learn from the successes and apply them to uh, some of the problems. Uh, in theory, that's something uh, easier to do than it is in practice, but um, it's, it should be through answering this kind of uh, what education policy in different places is uh, doing, what public policy in general uh, looks like across places, that we might be able to transfer some of the success to, to the highest uh, needs that school, uh, schools and students have. Jim, and then we'll let Martin do cleanup. Um, I, I don't know if living in wealthy areas helps low-income students. Uh, actually, I would think it should, but I, I don't know. And I, my guess is that this has little or no relevance to making post-secondary education free, but perhaps Martin could comment on that. Emma commented on the race and ethnicity issue. I'd like to address your issue about the achievement gap. Um, um, th before this panel convened this morning, we were talking uh, in one of the offices, and we discussed the fact that for a long time we've all known about Massachusetts, but, as you said. But what I liked about this study was suddenly we're introducing North Carolina and Texas into the discussion. So there's a much, I think this is a much richer discussion and opens up the possibility of uh, investigating in the ways that Emma talked about uh, what explains the success and whether it in fact does anything in terms of closing the achievement gap. One of the things that interested me in the roundtable report about the iceberg effect is we looked into the achievement gap as reported by OECD in these nine countries. And we talk about the achievement gap as though the United States is the only country in the world that has such a thing. But in fact, it's apparent everywhere. And the largest achievement gap turns out to be in Japan. Uh, according to this OECD data. So that's a very complex issue that obviously requires a lot more study, I think not only here, but internationally as well. Yeah, and let, uh, let me follow up on that and then deal quickly with some other things. Um, the achievement gap is uh, a, a very complicated issue, and I'll, and I'll c characterize it very simply. It, Massachusetts has a higher achievement gap between the lowest scoring it's at the lowest group, uh, the disadvantaged kids and the most advantaged kids. Um, uh, it, Alabama has a much lower achievement gap between, the, much lower than between the highest scoring kids and the lowest scoring kids. Florida has a much lower achievement gap. Um, but on the TIMS, for example, uh, in which nine states took the TIMS in 2011, uh, uh, Alabama, Florida, and Massachusetts among them, uh, the lowest uh, group, 
low, the most disadvantaged kids in Massachusetts scored the same as the most advantaged kids in Alabama. So this is the question that I would pose back to you. Would you rather have, if you're from a, lo a low family academic resource family, would you rather go to school in Massachusetts or would you rather go to school in Alabama? Your gap is lower in Alabama, but you're scoring very high in Massachusetts. And I think the, the answer is obvious. That's why I feel, and there's another reason why achievement gap is, a, I wouldn't call it a nonsense variable, but it, it isn't. It's an interesting, no, it's an interesting variable, but it's an interesting thing to focus on. But think about this. One of the highest, besides Japan, one of the highest achievement gaps is in Sweden. And by the way, Japan falls in the same category. If you score low on a test, on tests in the United States, in terms of your future uh, income and social position, you are in a much worse situation than in Sweden. In Sweden, doesn't make the difference in income and status because of the tremendous safety net in Sweden and the kinds of policies they have, even under conservative governments. The difference for you is not great. First of all, it's almost universal higher education, uh, post-secondary education, and all these opportunities later on are very equal because there's equal income distribution, equal, more equal wealth distribution, more equal everything out the end. This is what EPI is so concerned about. It's much, in the United States, we have a lower achievement gap than in Sweden, but the consequences of this gap are much greater than in Sweden. And we talk about the, we talk about test scores, and we should be talking about test scores, because they measure something about learning of kids in school. But we should never stop talking about the link between these, what's going on in schools and what's happening out in the economy. Okay, uh, I'd, I would rather be getting low test scores in Sweden than in the United States. That's the point. Uh, any, and, last, any last concluding remarks, Martin? Yes, There's lots I, of time I would just say one thing on, um, race and ethnicity. One of the most interesting findings that we have, which we didn't report here because we're going to do other papers on this, is that once we control for the social class composition, this is what Emma was saying, once we control for the social class composition of schools, the race composition of schools adds nothing. And this is really important because there are people everywhere in the U.S. Who, are to, who, who focus on race composition of schools as if a high concentration of blacks in a school really makes the difference. It is they're, they're black. And it turns out from, from what we're showing, what we're indicating from these NAEP data, that it's not the concentration of uh, the ethnicity in the school, it's the concentration, of, it's, it's, a how, it's a social class issue. And I think that it, it, that's very important. That doesn't mean that individual race still has an important effect on test scores, the individual's race, but not the concentration when you, once you control for SES. And I think that's really an important, another important result like this poverty thing. The nice thing about doing this kind of analysis that all these kind of things bubble up uh, as you do this in terms of trying to understand what goes into uh, test scores. So we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to work on these data, and as soon as the 2015 data come out, <laughs> we'll analyze them too. All right. Thank you, everybody. There's lunch. Yes, yes. For those of you in the room, join us for lunch. And lots of opportunities to talk some more. Thanks for having us.